Oh, it's good. We met Oswald uh, uh, about uh, in uh, in the summer of last um, 1962, when we heard that uh, there was a young couple who arrived from Russia and were in very difficult financial condition. So a friend of mine and myself drove to Fort Worth and uh, found this tenement house where he was living near Montgomery Ward. I had the impression that he was in love with Marina and uh, that on his side there was no unhappiness. What happened? What's the thing uh, I remember now? That he did not want Marina to learn English, maybe because he was in an intensely je jealous person. He did not want, want Marina to communicate with other people. Yeah. What happened yeah. actually, you know, that I was standing there on the balcony and my wife and Marina were looking at the rifle which was inside of the closet, you know. And Marina said to my wife, look at that idiot, he has a rifle here. Instead of, uh, instead of buying food or necessities for our home, you know, he bought a rifle. And uh, that's what I just overheard, which, but I actually did not even look in the closet, you know. And it seemed to me like such a ridiculous idea for Oswald to buy a rifle when he needed money so desperately, you know, that uh, it's, it's, it, was, it was just a big joke. Yes, it's, it's terrible. He's got a $9 rifle in the state of Texas. It's an outrage. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever seen, Hunley. Well, you, you don't go looking in the closet for a rifle? Right. Well, of course, especially in Texas, a guy has a $12 rifle that he bought from Klein Sporting Goods. It's crazy. He can't even buy a hamburger. I agree. And see, look, I'm starting early. Remember to subscribe, folks. Oh, yeah. That... I'll, I'll punch this a few times throughout. Uh, you know, I think it's working, Hunley. I, I hope so. You know what? We, we're on the threshold. We're within a couple hundred of getting 20,000. Oh, we can All get right. 20,000. I'm going to do it 100 times tonight, then, under, under <laughs> nom de plumes. <laughs> nom de plumes. 20,000. 20,000 20, to one. 20,000 to one. Yeah. Well, yeah, don't stop at twenty thousand. Everybody, no. yeah, feel no. free. We'll, we'll keep going right What's beyond. What's our goal? That. Like a hundred thousand? What are we trying to get to? Well, that's our next big goal, sure. Right, right. W what are we trying to get to? Uh, Russell Brand. We Russell want Brand. To... Russell yeah, Brand. I mean, he uh, a million. Uh, oh, he's at like five point eight million, almost six right. million. But you I know what? I'll back up. Just go over there and start writing in the comment section saying, "Come on over." You know. Maybe you know what? Before that, we'll just go after valuetainment. That's a good, good right. level. Yeah, about three or four million. We'll go for right. that. Right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're easy to please. Okay, so who, who is this guy with the foreign accent we were just, just watching? Just a regular guy. What, what difference does it make? It's just a guy passing through the story. What, is, what complications could this guy have in his life? Oswald's uh, best friend. He sees a rifle. What difference does it make, Hunley? Just another weird guy. Well, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But, but you're, you're going to set us straight, man. No, I'm going to set you straight. But, I mean, I'm just talking about on the surface – Everybody knows this general story that George DeMorenschild was his friend and, and you know, may or may not have seen a rifle and was some sort of immigrant or something, lived in Texas, and may yeah. or may not have known Ruth Payne or introduced him to Ruth Payne. That's all we really know. No, yeah, he obviously is proving that Oswald had the rifle, so he's a very important witness for history. Right, that's right, that's right. He's a link, bes besides General Walker, he and there's an, another extension to that video, which I, I don't think he talks about in the video, but he says to um, Hunley, don't forget to say like too. Um, <laughs> Roger that. Up. There's another part of that video or not the video, but the transcript of what he actually said um, was that, did you take a pot shot at General Walker? And this is what he said oh. to the Warren Commission. His testimony before the Warren Commission, just for the record, was the longest of any of the hundreds of witnesses before the Warren Commission. There was nobody who testified longer with less information than George de Schultz in the Warren Commission hearing. So this minor character seems to have testified for hours and hours and hours to the Warren Commission uh, about his relationship to Lee Harvey Oswald. And he 
says to Oswald, did you take a pot shot at Walker, according to DeMar and Schilt? Um, and, and he says that uh, Oswald got uh, very tense and made a f- unusually funny face at that question. And then Marina said that he goes to the park and takes pot shots at squirrels with the rifle. <laughs> Completely untrue, but nevertheless. Not even worthy to be swatted. Well, th- th- there are problems in life, and to be not considered for swatting, I can survive that. So what if we swat you. each other? That might be help the media press on the channel. <laughs> Two men swatted, and we won't even say that we did it to each other. We'll just say we were swatted. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? That'll put us with Tim Pool and the quarter. Right. And they're Nick probably Arcana. doing it to yeah, themselves. Yeah, we're idiots. You know, well, you know, we're, we're in the swatting crew. So right, right. Cool people swat is part of the grift. Anyway, oh, so man. this guy, Demorne Schilt, who his real name is Jersey Von Jersey Sergi Von Demorne Schilt, uh, was born in a place that we now know as Belarus. Uh, hmm. Like in 1911, his father. By the way, th- this is not a minor character. I was just kidding about that. This is a major player in American geopolitics, and I was just kind of laughing about it. But the Baron, as he was known, and he is a Baron. This is not a guy who is bullshitting. His father was the noble governor of Minsk, and his family ran the noble oil company uh, out of the Black Sea. Uh, this is during the Tsar. And when the Mm. revolution happened, his father was arrested. They were going to send him to uh, Siberia. His brother was also in prison, Dmitry, who we're going to learn about. And Demorenschild and his father and his mother escaped uh, to Poland. They escaped to Poland where they had another estate in Wilno. Uh, They had obviously a lot of wealth and the um, Marxists (laughs) wanted to take it. So they took what he had in Belarus and but they didn't get his stuff in 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 Poland, so they he fled to mm. Poland uh, with the father. The mother died of typhoid, I think, in route. Uh, the brother later escaped. That's Dmitry von Morenschild, who never changed his name to D Morenschild. Uh, um, he changes it from von to D in 1938, 39, and starts working for French intelligence. But, We'll get to that. Mm. He takes away the Vaughn because of the Nazis. And it ju- when yeah. he comes to the United States, he removes the Vaughn, puts in the French D. Morenschild. His brother never does that, though. His brother ends up coming to New York and keeps the Vaughn, interesting enough. Well, I got confused by that because I'm going, D looks like a French name, but he yeah, seems to be, have a Slavic name. And I'm like, what? what, what right, was right. He, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> they were Swedish and Germanic, uh, but, you know, Russian, Swedish, Germanic uh, roots. The father yeah, they, had, they had overlapped, the, sure. Yeah, they overlapped, and the father has that. He comes, um, he comes to the United States in 1938, and, but his brother is already here. Now you say, well, who's his brother? His brother, Dimitri von Morenschild, uh, goes to Columbia, goes to Yale, gets degrees in, in European literature, and uh, uh, begins teaching at Dartmouth, um, the brother. Hmm. They, this is, th- these are not Respectable minor- family. Respectable, respectable family. His brother is in the OSS with William Donovan and starts something called Radio Free Europe. On like Wild Bill himself. That's My right. Guy. That's right. That's the brother. <laughs> the brother starts Radio Free Europe. He starts a. Um, so uh, so we're 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 so tied to CIA. We're we're tied pre CIA. Like yes, helping yes, build the right. CIA. This is oh, so great. in bed with the CIA. <laughs> it starts before the CIA is even created. This story. That's yeah. how deep this goes. This and, of course, to, he's friends with uh, with Oswald, who has no affiliation whatsoever. Absolutely not. Absolutely. We're, we're going to see how that evolves from 1938 to 1963, because his uh, he goes and, and stays with his brother. Now, where's his brother? His brother's just summering on Long Island uh, in 1938. So he joins his brother because, they're, you know, where are you going to go? And his brother is staying with the uh, Bouvier family and... Um, De uh works his way into the Bouvier family. Be- this that's, Bouvier? Yeah, that's Jack Pl- Black Jack Bouvier, the father of the Bouvier clan, the um, Wall Street uh, uh, investor. He's married to another Bouvier and has a daughter named Jackie. Now they get divorced. That Jack Black Bouvier, Black Jack, gets divorced, and the mother begins dating a guy named George De 
Well, look at I don't that. know if you have a picture of the mother. I think you might just to, to put up for the ladies at home who these Bouviers are, because a lot of the women know. Yeah, sure. Know sure. who they are. That's the mother. Hold That's on, Jackie Bouvier's that mother right there. She gets divorced from uh, Blackjack and she begins dating George de Now, the Amazing. daughter, be, the daughter begins calling him Uncle George. There's the daughter. She will grow up to marry the president of the United States, who's supposedly killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, the best friend of George de Good night, folks. Thanks for having me. Enjoy. Yeah, have, the a nice the day. Day. <laughs> have a nice day. Have a nice day. Jackie. Uh, actually would sit on George's knee and he would tell her stories, bedtime stories. Uh, he was going to be her father, uh, stepfather, obviously. But the mother felt that that uh, George didn't have enough money. She loved that he was a uh, Euro trash baron, but apparently didn't have enough funding. There's a Jackie with her father. Great photo of Jackie Kennedy. Uh, this right here, Jackie Bouvier at this point. And that's her dad. Um, the dad obviously disappears and George tries to get in there. George then dates her aunt, uh, one of the Bouviers. Her aunt uh, Bouvier almost married him. I think they were it was he was the fiance. Yeah, there's look at that photo, ladies, for you ladies at home. Look at that outfit. Look at the dress. Look at the flowers. It looks like it's about 1932. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful incredible amounts of money, this family. So George and his brother um you know are are now in in bed with this family and there's nothing wrong with them then i mean the, he, dimitri is well you know documented to have degrees and george has all these degrees he has degrees from europe he he went to school in brussels he has degrees in in uh, petroleum geology and russian uh, literature european literature these are not bums it's uh, aristocracy, actually. Yes, yes. In reality, they are. They're not, you know, they're not really Euro trash. I'm saying that being funny. But mm -hmm. later on, he becomes more Euro trash E, if that makes any sense, uh, and how he operates. This is a guy who is a complete narcissist, a pathological liar, an atheist, and a sociopath. Just so you know that whatever that video showed you, that's what he really was behind this behind those eyes. This is a six foot two, handsome, rugged man, ladies man, and he did not have to try hard to get women. He had four wives, one wealthier than the next. Um, he was trying to work with the Bouviers, but there were others coming down the pike. And we're going to go through each of his wives because I think the ladies at home might find that interesting. So right. uh, the first one he marries is a 18 year old teenager named Dorothy Pearson in 1942. Uh, he marries Pearson in New York. I think that might even made the New York Times uh, this marriage. Her father, it, yeah, there it is. It actually makes the papers. Uh, becomes bride here, Dorothy Pearson, 18 years old. Thank you, Journey Through the Gate Paranormal. And ooh -ha, ooh -ha. Thank you, Beverly Fitch. Just, hey, new, new customer, new oh. person. Oh, Thank wow. you very, Welcome very, very aboard. much. Welcome aboard. Good to have you. And hold on. We got one more because we got lots of dots here. This is oh. a moment of dots and, <laughs> and a hell of a this show. Chat. This episode has a million dots. I'll tell you so, that right yeah, now. Right on time appropriate. Right. So um, he marries Dorothy Pearson. Her father uh, is in the State Department. Her father's an oil guy. Her father's CIA and um, pre-CIA OSS right here. And and comes from a lot of money, Pearson. He beats her up. He beats up all his wives, by the way. He smacks them around. They all accuse him of, of being a homosexual, which he's really not. But I think that's a way to get out of these marriages. Uh, there's no evidence. With this story, it wouldn't surprise me. I know, but of all the literature I've read, I've never read an incident of it. This is a man who who really likes women. <laughs> that's all I can say. I don't know if he likes them. He might be a misogynist. Let me take that back. Because he does get uh, drunk and violent with them. Uh, so he could be a complete sociopath in that regard, too. But there's no there's no stories of him with men. That's all I could say. The women use this as a way to get out of the marriages. And sure. also the, the physical abuse. There's, some of these marriages are very short. The one with her, uh, I think, is about two years. Um, in 1945, he, they moves to Texas and he gets a degree from the University of Texas at Austin. 
And here's where he starts to hook up with a new group of friends. And these friends are not uh, unknown. His crew that he's working with includes people like uh, Clint Murchison, H.L. Hunt, uh, Sid Richardson. These are his friends. This is his gang. Yeah, look at that. Look at that shot. That's a good one. That's a great one. There's, uh, uh, I think that's Sid Richardson. Clint. That's this Clint Murchison. Clint. Okay. That's Clint Murchison Jr. These are Here's, all. This is Sid. Let me see Sid. Sid's with the hat. Yeah, that's that's an honest looking guy. These are the oil barons of Texas, Hunt. They all hire him at some point as a petroleum geologist. Uh, that's the biggest HL one Hunt. right that's there. A great one. Yeah. H.L. Hunt becomes a, uh, another one who hires him. And they're not hiring him to dig holes in the ground. They're hiring him to secure oil leases and to do um, surveys and find out where the petroleum is and negotiate deals. He's not very good at this, nor does he care, because what he's really doing is gathering intelligence for different services. In, in 1940, he's working for French intelligence in New York before the Nazis take over uh, France. He's working for intelligence operatives in France to prevent the Americans from selling oil to the Germans and to sell it cheaper to the French. Uh, this, if this sounds familiar to today, you are correct. <laughs> this is again, again, oil geopolitics in 1940. Uh, this is what he's involved in. He's involved in this his entire life and working for the intelligence services he will end up further down this story in another odd place involving oil this entire story involves oil it involves oil out of the state of texas it involves oil out of the united states oil out of haiti oil out of baku and the black sea where he starts out in the oil business in the oil business you mean he might be tied into another family with oil? Oh, well, there's. I'm not even going to get to that family because this family, <laughs> he goes to Venezuela to work for William F. Buckley for his family's oil company in the Venezuela. The William F. Buckley? Yes, that family, my friend. You didn't see that coming, did you, Hunley? No, no, no. Okay, so there, there's a Venezuelan oil company that's owned by the Buckley family, and he goes to work for them in Venezuela. Then he works his way into Mexico and you go, well, what's he doing in Mexico? He gets a mistress who is the he, he gets a mistress who's the girlfriend. Um, <laughs> yeah. He gets a, he gets a girlfriend who is the mistress of the brother of the president of Mexico and who actually runs Mexico. And he's a fascist and he's the real power behind the president of Mexico, the brother. And and he starts an affair with her hmm. and the two of them run around Mexico and he does these watercolors of Mexico, these paintings of Mexico. He, he and he writes a novel when he's in Mexico, uh, but the oil paintings are really, the watercolors are really nice. Um, so he is talented. Oh, he has talent. My friend, those watercolors will end up in the Newton gallery on 57th street, 75 of them, to amazing reviews by the New York New York Times a couple of years later, uh, having nothing to do with this story. Wow. I mean, it does, but I mean, he he obviously has talent as an as a painter. This is hmm. just on the side. He ends up in a gallery show in in New York on Fifty Seventh. So he Street. kind of is a Renaissance man. Oh, no <laughs> doubt about it. This is I love this guy. I love this guy. He he writes a novel about a guy in Mexico, and it's him with her having these affairs, and. Anyway, he ends up in Corpus Christi, Texas, by a Coast Guard base, and he starts painting the Coast Guard base and taking some photos, and he's arrested. He's arrested for spying on us by the Coast Guard. And they go, what are you doing here? And he's been allowed into the United States. He's been allowed in. He's got every piece of paper legally that you are supposed to have. Um, a declaration that he's going to become a U.S. citizen, which he does a couple of years later. He's got a 4F uh, classification to not be in the war, saying he's got a bad heart. He's got all the green cards, blue cards, red cards, whatever you need to get into the United <laughs> States in 19. He's got a deck of cards. He's got a deck of cards. <laughs> and they said, well, this is a very strange situation. And he says, oh, I don't care what you think. I want to go back to Mexico and visit my girlfriend. Right. And she's trying to come here. He wants to go back there. But they smell a rat and they go, nah, we're not going to give you a visa to Mexico, bro. 
we'll let you stay here and run around the United States, but we're not going to give you a, a visa to Mexico. So you know what he does? This is insane. He appeals the ruling, and at the appeal, the heads of the ONI, FBI, State Department, the, the Army Intelligence, all appear at his request, and he meets them all through this public forum where he wants them to know him. He wants them to say, I am here for you. And he files an appeal of his uh, declination to have a visa to go to Mexico. They all show up. A four-star general shows up and they're all going, they all in order to show up because of this appeal process. Not that they're, he's anything, you know, crazy. They show up because of this process and the State Department shows up, the CIA, everyone, and he meets every single one of them. And that's really the beginning of his indoctrination into U.S. intelligence. And that's yeah. how he does it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He loses the appeal, but he meets every single person he's now going to work for for the next 20 years. <laughs> crafty dude. But then again, I mean, look at his, his background. You his know, background is very crafty. Had a wiggle out of whatever. Yes, and he's a genius get of killed. getting in and out and getting actual stuff. Okay, they send him, uh, there's a guy named Jay Walton Moore. Now, Jay Walton Moore, I don't know if you have a photo of Jay Walton Moore, because he's going to come up in this story in a little while. Uh, Jay Walton Moore, that's him here, he's an OSS. He ends up being the head of the CIA station in Dallas. And Jay Walton <laughs> Moore will become, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jay Walton Moore assigns uh, DeMorenschild to go to Yugoslavia to help the Yugoslavian government under Tito in 1957 to try to get them, ready for this, to stop buying Russian oil and to <laughs> buy it from us. And that's what his job is, is to go around and try to help Yugoslavia develop their oil industry. And what he really does is take photos of the of the military that's there, take photos of all their bases, take photos of everything. And he barely gets out of Yugoslavia, but he does. And he comes back and he reports to uh, Jay Walton Moore what the communist situation is, the military situation is, the oil situation is in Yugoslavia. So they begin using him in Eastern Europe where he makes his bones. I mean, this is his background. This is what he knows. And they keep sending him over there. And he comes back, I think, in 19... He marries uh, Pearson. He gets out of it. In 1947, he gets married again to Phyllis Washington, whose father is in the State Department, who is a CIA apparatchik in the State Department. Uh, her nickname is Fifi. He marries Fifi, and she's kind of a party girl, Fifi. He likes Fifi. He goes skiing in Aspen with her. They have a ton of money, lives off of Fifi's money for a couple of years until 1949 when he gets divorced from Fifi under the same auspices, um, cheating on her, uh, abusing her, blah, blah, blah. Gay again or no? Again, she threatens the gay. She threatens oh, okay. the gay privately. It doesn't seem to phase him because he says – we have a different uh, morality in Europe than you people have here. So I don't know if he acknowledged it or what, but he may have just been talking about uh, womanizing because he cheats on all of them with women, you know, and right in their, in, in their face. Uh, and so to, to reward him in 1949, he becomes a U.S. citizen. <laughs> so that really helps him. And he comes to, um, comes to Dallas and he joins the Dallas Petroleum Club, like I said, which is, has these people as members. The Dallas Petroleum Club has another group called the uh, World Council, which is an extreme right wing anti-communist group of a lot of Russians who have moved to Dallas hmm. and who are in the oil business, uh, as we see today with Russian oil. These guys um, know a lot about oil. They, you know, he hooks up with a, a company called Zapata Oil. And Zapata is owned by a family uh, with the name of Bush. <laughs> and he starts working for the Bush family as an oil executive and also with these uh, oil lease rights and things of that nature. 
And now he's operating with the Bush family. I mean, you can't make this up. There's more too many dots here for one episode. I think this is kind of crazy. But, you know, he 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 starts doing all this stuff and he ends up actually teaching uh, humanities at a <laughs> I think at the university, a bishop college or something, but he's hitting on all the women and he, he becomes a teacher and of languages. Um, 1951, he marries uh, Dee Dee Sharples, another wealthy heiress to another wealthy family. Uh, Pearson, by the way, at 18, had already inherited her, um, you know, what you call when you, when you have your uh, family give you money. Now, what's her name again? Uh, this one he marries in 57 is Dee Dee Sharples. Um, when his wife three. That's wife number three. This is a, okay. This I'm is trying to keep up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Dee Dee Sharples also comes from an extremely wealthy family. He has two kids with her. And both kids develop cystic fibrosis and die. And mm. the two of them launch the uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that's still in existence to this day, like the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation. Uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation uh, still exists today, raising money mm. for that horrible disease. The kids die at like nine and 12 or something, Ooh. or seven and five. I mean, very young. Well, it's uh, a horrible disease. It's, it's horrible, like a horrible now. disease. Yeah. Um, and then he gets divorced from her. In 1959, he marries Jean Lagan, who is... Yeah, that, that's the fourth and final wife. Uh, kind of no. looks like she knows he's had some wives before. That expression oh, yeah, is yeah. saying, I, uh, you're, you're yeah. not playing with me, buddy. Her father <laughs> her father ran the uh, Chinese Manchurian Railroad and was killed by the communists when they took over. Uh, she's another very anti-communist. She was born in Manchuria, uh, uh, Jean Lagan. And uh, her father was was a huge railroad guy and ran the railroad through Manchuria and was killed by the commies. Uh, so she escaped with her life. And, the, and she becomes an intelligence operative also, is the point of the story. The two of them work together, which is the first time, really. Um, she she was a dancer and an artist and, and an actress, but those were all covers. She She really worked with him on these intelligence operations for the first time. This becomes like the Americans, the show. The other mm. three were just, you know, for him, were, were just sex objects and money objects for him to uh, get to where he wanted to go. He would, he always had money, though. I mean, he would borrow money. He always paid it back. He would borrow money from these petroleum companies, always paid it back. Hmm. Um, the, the government would give him money, obviously, for these different missions. And uh, these heiresses would, even when he got divorced, he would start businesses with the father-in-law. He kept all the relationships of the family. That's saying something. I know. I know. They trusted him. And again, the guy was a pathological liar and a con man. But again, the con was so high. The stakes were so enormous. They had files on him and CIA documents going back to 1938. And he was doing our bidding. You know, I mean, this was this was one of our guys. And when he hooks up with Lagan, their job is to interweave themselves with the white Russian community in Dallas. These were the anti-communists who were in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And there was rumors that he was a Nazi spy at one time. He's been on every side of history, uh, George. He, he, he apolitical, but he's been on. He was for Franco Spain. Then he was against the Nazis. Then he worked with the Nazis. Then he was for us. Then he was for the commies. He's all whoever will pay him. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of like he's apolitical and he's part of the game. But when they begin to uh, enter into the white Russian community, they hear from a guy named George Bowie about this kid. Now the kid is Lee Harvey Oswald. But J. Walton Moore in Dallas in 1961 tells him that there's this kid in your hometown in Minsk. And he goes, really? He says, yeah, this is before Oswald comes back. He's already made aware of Oswald's existence in Minsk. Oh, you mean the and lone nut that nobody cares about? The lone nut that nobody cares about. He's part of the game. And, and he goes, oh, Oswald, he's a good kid. And, and what, he says, when he comes back, I want you to meet him. In other words, to be his handler. So when Oswald does come back, guess who goes to meet him? 
George de Morinchild. George de Morinchild is sent to have lunch with Oswald by J. Walton Moore. And that's where our story really begins in terms of JFK. Because he is sent by the Dallas bureau chief, J. Walton Moore de Morinchild, as he said to the Warren Commission, I wouldn't have gone to meet Oswald without their permission in a million years. He said, I had to have their permission to go do what I did. I couldn't care less. You know what I mean? Like, why would he go meet Oswald? That makes own? sense. It's absurd. It's <laughs> yeah. absurd. He, he has no interest in, he knows that all of these people are involved in very sensitive operations. He's not going to just randomly go meet this guy. You know what I mean? He had lunch with Jay Walton Moore in 1961. Moore testifies to the Warren Commission that he indeed did have lunch with George Marshall in 1961. Wow. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Well, that's just the beginning. <laughs> Let me see a couple of these photos. I'm just curious as to what we have up there today. Okay. Let me see what you got. Maybe there's some... Um... <clears throat> we're not too... I think the baby docs uh, or Papa Doc... Oh, no, we're not up to that yet. No, They're no, all no. coming. We're, we're, we're right. working on right, we'll the get, letters. Okay. We'll get there. We got, we'll get yeah. there. We're at story time. We're, this is story time. So, okay, he did the hearing... He, he introduces them, and now he becomes, you only took 30 minutes. You got to make it the story. <laughs> well, what can I tell you? I got to tell you the back story. I mean, you, you know, everybody knows the front story. So he goes over to um, meet with the Oswalds, and they take him under their wings. They take him to picnics. They take him to lunch. He doesn't have any money, the Oswalds. But it's not about that. Oswald knows what this is about, and so does Marina. This is their guy. This is the couple that's handling them. You know, Gene Lagan and, and George de Morinchild, a.k.a. the de Morinchilds, are their official handlers. Now, that means they take them to parties. They take them around, which is what they do. They take Oswald to meet the various white Russian community. Now, he speaks perfect Russian. So does George de Morinchild. So does his wife. So does everybody. And, and Marina. Everyone's wailing in Russian. So... One, one party they take him to, there's another couple he introduces him to, and this woman speaks perfect Russian. And he says, I'd like you to meet this woman here, and maybe, you know, you will like her. She's very nice, <laughs> and her name is Ruth Payne. Payne. Right. And that's, <laughs> how, that's how we get to Ruth Payne. This is through um, J. Walton Moore to George DeMore and Shilton, his wife, to uh, uh, Ruth Payne. And the reason that he's introduced to Ruth Payne is because eventually George de Morinchild is, is going to have to go on another mission. And he can't stay in Dallas to continue what he's doing here because he is much more of an international agent. Ruth Payne will become an international agent uh, a number of years later in the 80s when she's sent to Costa Rica and El Salvador and Honduras uh, in the 80s. But right now she's more of a domestic agent. And... De Morinchild is much more international, and he's going to have to go do something, which I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes. But the reality of it is he turns her over, that, the couple over, to the pains. But before he does, we get that rifle incident where they come over to the house and see the rifle and ask him if he killed or shot at, shot at uh, General Edwin Walker. Now, you know, that's crock of shit obviously and the <laughs> rifles are crock of shit but this is all done post-mortem crazy in 1967 when he comes back to the united states the morning shield will go through his luggage and he finds a photo of oswald the exact same photo of oswald with the rifle and the uh handgun that was photographed in the backyard ostensibly by marine oswald he finds another copy of it exactly the same copy and on the back, it says to my friend George, <laughs> on the back, this is a very famous story uh, from Lee, killer of fascists. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, but this is, this is five years later, Eric. This is five years later. So they check the handwriting, and it's not Oswald's. It's not DeMorne Shields. It's not Marina's, and it's not his wife. So nobody knows whose handwriting this is, but it says, killer of fascists to my friend George. Uh, ha, ha, ha sign Lee, and it's in pencil with ink over it, if that means anything to anybody at home that hmm. maybe they were tracing it or something. But it's the same exact photo, same exact famous photo, another copy of it. <laughs> of and he course. says he get, Lee gave it to him 
you know, the day uh, after he shot at Walker, you know, so uh, this is all, you know, 2020 hindsight by DeMar and Schultz in six, 1967. So that was kind of a weird story. Kind of like but, backfilling a story, so to speak. Yeah, they're backfilling all of these stories because, I mean, w what he's doing with the Walker shooting is providing a second voice behind Walker's that Lee shot at him. I mean, if you think about it, who who are the voices that Lee shot at him? Marina Oswald changes her tune a couple of years later. Uh, she's one of the voices who says that. Um, of course, Ruth Payne says it, but she doesn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. The rifle has to uh, be used on Walker to establish he has that rifle, which, of course, he doesn't. That's all made up. I mean... The fact that he that he would buy a fort as as many have pointed out, the fact that he would buy a fourteen dollar rifle through the mail with an anonymous name when he could go to the corner in Texas and buy any rifle he wants without even an ID is of course absurd. Now, as a side story, uh, just so you know, at the time the Senate was having hearings, the Senate was having hearings at that time about preventing mail order rifles from going through the mail. And this might have been part of an operation a lot of experts believe that Oswald was involved in for somebody in the Senate uh, to purchase these uh, guns through the mail. Okay, I get it. I get right. It set up. Right. And he was part of that uh, uh, operation to see how easy it was to purchase weapons through the mail because he could have gone anywhere in Dallas and bought the gun. It's, it's stupid. The, st the backstory is stupid. He might have been doing it for another reason. And simultaneously, there was these hearings in the United States Senate about mail order uh, rifles. Just my opinion. And those are facts, but that's my opinion on it, you know, uh, for, what it's, for what it's worth. All right. Look at this courtesy. Um, $10 for, for us and the rest to the bloodsuckers. Yeah. So we actually we're calculated. In, in, that, <laughs> at fourteen twenty nine. we're going to, is that the year or something? That no, no, no. It's, um, it's calculating how much YouTube's going to take out. That's so funny. we actually get 10 bucks. Oh, I got you. That's kind of funny. Yeah, it is. And Tyler, yes, more dots are coming. Promise. Yeah. Tyler loves these dots. So all of this is over and overseen by the 902nd army intelligence Corps. Now the 902nd, AKA the 90 deuce, is a very, very uh, infrequently mentioned military intelligence group that's involved in this thing. Not the 112th in Dallas. This is the 90 Deuce. And they're going to be dealing with DeMar and Schilt going to Haiti in a couple of minutes in this story mm -hmm. when I get around to it. And um, some of the other aspects of this story, which is now just beginning a little bit into the show. <laughs> so that was all the backstory. You know, the Baron uh, also urges Lee Harvey Oswald to complete his memoirs. And and the Baron, of course, is a great writer. He writes this brilliant novel, which doesn't get published. Uh, he, he does this one. This is OK. This is merely the transcript of I Am a Patsy, which George DeMorenshill wrote about himself. And I have a cop. I have the audio CD of that read by DeMorenshill himself, which I'm going to try to put on locals. Yeah, I have get, the it, audio get it on there. Okay, we'll I have the there. audio book of that, just so you know. It's oh, called perfect. I'm, yeah, I couldn't do it here because it's just technologically impossible. But um, he writes a, a book called I'm a Patsy, and it's about his relationship with Oswald. And he writes this novel, which doesn't get published. He does do the watercolors. He gets those, you know, heralded in New York. But he And he urges Oswald to finish his memoir. And Oswald goes and he hires a, um, a stenographer. Basically, because Oswald's got all this stuff on scraps of paper that he smuggled back from Minsk in his diary. It's handwritten. He wants to get it into a book form. And he begins to pay her whatever it is, a dollar a ten, a dollar ten a page or some crap. And he goes to see her and she's typing up the lone nuts uh, memoir, the, the lone nut that nobody knows <laughs> that no one's ever met. And, and it's just a lone nut. But he, he's he's writing a book. This is before he speaks at the college in Springfield in uh, the Spring Springville in, in in Alabama, which we're going to get to in a later episode when he when he speaks at the university. But now he's working on the book because that's what Lone Nuts does. You know, I think Hinckley did all these things, and obviously Manson. And is that one of the watercolors? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course, there uh, looks like they're of oil rigs or something. Yeah, right? they're Baku. Um, right. Right. Baku right. oil rigs, 1931. Wow. Wow, Sorry, I just, that's, while that's, we were talking about it, I thought I'd find that. Wow, that's great. 
Well, he does this, like I said, in Mexico, and he does this um, um, in Yugoslavia. He does the same thing. It's a good cover. He does take photos, by the way, but he's more interested in doing it like this. That That's pretty good. That's pretty damn good. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah so that. that's part of his intelligence strategy, but he... Um, he tells Oswald to finish the novel, and he turns them over at this point to uh, Ruth and Michael Payne. And he then goes, this is a, on a walking tour of Central America. He walks through with his wife, with his wife. They go on a walking tour, and they walk through all of the countries and report back to Jay Walton Moore what's going on in every country. Uh, literally, it takes them months, months. They, they don't have a vehicle. He has two, he has three guns on him. They're confiscated at the border in Honduras. But uh, there's nothing he could do about that. And he ends up going to uh, a visit to Haiti. And that's where the story gets interesting when we get to Haiti. Uh, because as his reward for doing this for the CIA, they give him a $300,000 oil lease in Haiti, which is in his bank account in 1960. Three in April, he leaves around the time of the Walker shooting. Um, mm. In fact, right afterwards, because he mentions that in April 63. And he goes to Haiti and he gets this oil lease and he's supposed to uh, report back about the political climate in Haiti. So he hooks up with a guy named Clemmer Charles. Now, who is Clemmer Charles? Clemmer Charles is the banker of Papa Doc Duvalier. This is a rough picture of him from a C FBI document. Um, but Clemmer Charles is a banker who is the president of the largest private bank. Th this is Papa Doc Duvalier. Now, Papa Doc Duvalier, of course, becomes a brutal dictator, suspends all civil liberties when he takes over. OK, we tried to be in business with Papa Doc. And for a long time, we were. It was fine. He was anti-communist. He was totally corrupt. And he was able to, uh, like Noriega, uh, do our bidding. And But he was so corrupt and so anti-civil liberties and so freaking crazy that the United States began to look around for a replacement for uh, Papa Doc. Now, Papa Doc was a doctor, by the way. He was also into voodoo and some, some other stuff. But Papa Doc... Yeah, he had the Tantan Makut, and that was their badge uh, that they wore. This was a fascist, uh, repressive private army that uh, was a death squad, essentially, in Haiti, and they reported to uh, Papa Doc de Valier. Uh, Tantan Makut uh, means, <laughs> the, the straight definition of it means boogeymen. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the... the that's the boogeyman. And they were the boogeyman. They wore like mirrored shades. Um, they were very, very terrifying. And they were there for decades, for decades. I, yeah, I think two generations because baby yeah, yeah, doctors took they, it over. They, yeah. They then worked for baby Dr. Valier. But the, the reason that Clemmer Charles is important is a, he begins to become the partner to George de Morinchild, the business partner for George de Morinchild. And they begin to develop this petroleum company in Haiti uh, to work with guys like Brown and Root, uh, who become the um, the backers of a guy named LBJ. This time, this is all going to tie into LBJ now, because we're moving <laughs> along. LBJ has, I think, it's Clint Murchison has a meatpacking plant in Haiti where he's sending old dead cows that he doesn't need to Haiti as their meat supply. And they want to shut them down because it's so uh, bad. The health department of Haiti says we can't even do this anymore. But the point of the matter is there's a guy getting kickbacks from the meat being sold from Texas to Haiti. And that man is Bobby Baker, the Senate uh, connection to LBJ. And the Bobby guy who's Baker, about to testify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bobby Baker is kicking the money back to LBJ uh, as vice president and later as president. So LBJ, yeah, yeah, you can't make this up. LBJ has a colonel who is his military advisor named Burris. 
and he's the go-between between, between Clemmer Charles and De Mornschild. Um, here's a shot of Clemmer Charles. That's a secretary on the right, not his wife, who was assigned to him by the CIA, uh, unknown to him. And this is, I think this is one of the, this is your live shows or something. <laughs> you know, I don't know who the other guy is, like a, the host of a TV show. But the secretary on the right is CIA. And Clemmer Charles is our stooge. What we want to do is have a coup d'etat, replace Papa Doc with Clemmer Charles. And the guy arranging that is George de Morinchild. That's why George de Morinchild is in Haiti. This is where this is all going, my friends. <laughs> and, and apparently Papa Doc is not happy about that. So Papa Doc... Uh, <clears throat> what, he doesn't want to be replaced? He doesn't want to be replaced. And, and to his credit... I mean, Papa Doc is, is not a commie. You know, he is a fascist, you know, and, and we like fascists and we're doing business with him. Yeah, until we, he's inconvenient. Was Oswald really killed or Ruby? I'd say, yeah, they were, they were they're killed. I, I think that that's they're, Yeah, they're, they were killed, my friend. Yeah, they were and killed. Rolf is saying, um, screw it, live it up, bloodsuckers. Okay. <laughs> true, 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 true. Two dollars, but in, in, in Haiti, that was like a hundred dollars. That's so in, in Haiti, he wines and dines Clemmer Charles and, and he's got this money. You know, he's got three hundred thousand dollars of his own now, uh, DeMorne Schilt, and he is living pretty large, as he always does anyway. I mean, this guy was never on the balls of his ass at any time in his life, you know. So Burris, as the go between, as I said, Colonel Burris and Clemmer Charles. And this is in my LBJ miniseries, by the way. Maybe I could put up that script because it's now crossing over from Oswald to my LBJ stuff. Clement mm -hmm. Charles and Burris and DeMorenschild arrange a meeting with LBJ who keeps ducking them because he doesn't want to be in a physical meeting with people he's getting kickbacks from. Even though Clement Charles... Why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Burris kind of sets it up and LBJ keeps ducking it. And I couldn't find that he actually met with DeMorenschild. I was looking for that smoking gun. And I don't think I ever was able to find him meeting. He with probably White. avoided it. He did. He really did. But the meetings were on the books. I, I remember finding White House logs about proposals and meetings that were coming and uh, something came up for LBJ. He couldn't meet with them at the last minute. There was a couple of failed meetings. And Charles was uh, trying to meet with the guy who was the president of the United States. So they would have a relationship when he became the president of Haiti. Unfortunately, like I said, Papa Doc got wind of it and he put uh, uh, Clement Charles in a dirty, filthy Haitian prison. So that was uh, the as end. As one for, does. As one does. He would later be released uh, through us, immediately fly to Miami as they do. His money had disappeared, Clement Charles. And a couple of years later, we indicted him for bank fraud and put him in jail anyway. <laughs> so we rescued the guy who was a, an innocent guy. Kind of, He was like just a sweet banker. Really, the guy didn't have a bad bone in his body. And we just <laughs> said, you're going to be the president of Haiti. And he goes, oh, great. And ne next thing you know, he ends up in jail with Papa Doc. We get him out and then we put him in jail in Miami, you know, kind of like Noriega. I mean, it's really sad what happened to Clemmer Charles. <laughs> but uh, the meatpacking plant, I think got shut down and Murchison had to stop his kickbacks to LBJ over the Haitian beef. That was going to be a big scandal. But I think once he became president, he put the kibosh on that. Now, there's a letter which we're going to get to between a couple of Georges in a, in a few minutes. But what happens is uh, DeMoran Schilt um, begins to work on a, on a book and he begins to work on this thing. And he gets a letter one day that he's been called to testify before the House Assassinations Committee, and he's not happy to hear from them. And he tries to duck them. He's in Palm Beach uh, with his daughter. This his, is when now? This is 1976, I think. Okay, so it's uh, post JFK. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. This, uh, like, okay. this is, yeah. I, I, if you could show that video of his daughter, well, no, don't show that yet. We'll show that in a couple of seconds. But what I wanted to get at was he goes to Europe with a Dutch writer um, named Willem Oltman. Willem Oltman testifies before the House Assassination Committee. He takes um, um, uh, DeMarcio with him to Holland, 
DeMorn Schultz says, get me out of here. I'm going to be murdered. Nobody's going to let me testify before the House Assassinations Committee. Now you're saying, well, what could possibly happen to you? Well, ask, ask Johnny Roselli what happened to him when he got the subpoena. Ask Sam Giancana what happened to him when he got the subpoena. George DeMorn Schultz gets the subpoena. And he says, I got to get out of here. You mean a guy uh, that's uh, been everywhere in the freaking world tied to every intelligence agency might have caution? Yeah, so Roselli <laughs> ends up in a barrel floating off Biscayne Bay. Sam Giancana gets executed behind the back of his ear in his kitchen with FBI guarding him so he mm. doesn't get killed. They walk in and they shoot him in the back of the head anyway, Giancana, because he got a subpoena to testify too. It's not like that was this was mob shit. This was intelligent shit, Eric. You know what I mean? Right, right. So DeMorn Schilt sees the handwriting on the wall and says, I got to get out of here. So this guy, Oltmans, takes him to Holland and he says, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And he goes, who is it? And he goes, hey, he's a guy. He's just a regular guy. We'll have lunch with him. And he goes, who is he? What does he do? And he, he's Soviet KGB. So as he goes to sit down at the table, um, DeMarin Schultz says, I got to go to the bathroom. And he goes to the bathroom, goes out the back door and disappears. And he Martin. realized he was being set up by Oltmans to work with the KGB and possibly be kidnapped by them uh, back to the Soviet Union. And he smells this out and flees on foot out of Amsterdam. Um, and this is like 1975 or so. And the Soviet KGB guy is at the um, table waiting to have lunch with him. And Altman's will later write a book about George DeMarnshield. He'll, he'll also in the in the sarcastic humor of Oliver Stone, portray George DeMorenschild in the movie JFK. That's that's who William Altman's in. He's playing uh, uh, George DeMorenschild. Love it. Just like Garrison is portraying uh, Earl Warren. I mean, th th there's some subtle humor that Oliver does, and this is part of what turns him on, gives him his jollies, is having these guys play these guys who are their arch nemesis, is, you know. <laughs> but anyway, he comes back to New York, flees France, comes back to New York. His daughter, who we're going to show in a couple of minutes a video, his daughter is a knockout, um, is living in Palm Beach and in a mansion. And she says, yeah, you can come and stay with me. So he goes down to Palm Beach and he's interviewed by um, Edward J. Epstein. Now, Edward J. Epstein is a spook writer, a spook adjacent writer. Uh, he wrote one of the first books about the JFK assassination and then later flipped to the other side and became a, uh, um, uh, a, a exposer. Or... No, he became a lone nutter. I mean, he became, oh. Os and Os Oswald did it alone. He wrote a book um, Got it. that was a conspiracy book to get on the radar. And then he wrote book after book after book after that saying that Oswald did it by himself. So he is an, he's a spook writer. He's affiliated with the uh, intelligence services. And he goes and interviews DeMorin Schilt, interviews him, right? And, and you know, DeMorin Schilt gives him an interview. He pays DeMorin Schilt $4,000 for the interview, uh, by the way. And he's working for a spook-affiliated publication, for you people at home who don't know this, called Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest is a spook publication, just like National Geographic, just for you people at home who may not be aware of this, um, Reader's Digest traditionally spook publication. Um, mm. So anyway, he's working for Reader's Digest and gives him $4,000 to do the interview. But it's not about the interview. It's about keeping tabs on DeMorin Schultz, what he's going to do when he goes before the committee. And DeMorin Schultz knows that they're closing in on him, Eric. He smells mm. that they're closing in on him. And not only is, are they closing in on him, but a, form, a future Fox newsman is closing in on him. A guy from Fo who, who was working at local Fox in Dallas who begins in the mid-70s to make his bones as a journalist. 2020, I think. What's that? I think, yeah, he's working 2020 um, pretty soon after that. Oh, oh, that's another guy. That's another guy. But there's a guy on Fox who goes door to door and begins to interview people about the assassination. And that guy is on the trail of DeMorenschild, and his name is Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, he and, did 2022. 
Right. There's well, we have footage of of, of I'm not sure Geraldo what, what, Rivera, um, also who is well, on no, this is case. O'Reilly. Right, but I'm saying there's footage. Oh, I, we, yeah, don't okay. we have the Geraldo footage also? Uh I don't know, but I okay. got O'Reilly. Well, let's see what you got, because I'm curious as to what you got. This is the daughter. Okay. This is with Bill O'Reilly. Good good one. Getting back to Epstein for a minute. He came back from the interview with Epstein, and that's when the tragedy happened. Did he say anything to you about Epstein, or was he upset when he came back? From no, I talked to him, and I said, how's everything going? He said, everything is fine. I said, how's Mr. Epstein? He said, oh, he's very nice, very intelligent. Um, I said, uh, do you have to go and, and see him again today? And my father said, no, I don't have to go and see him until tomorrow, which I understand was not true. Wait a minute. You understand that was not true? No, we had an appointment with Mr. Epstein at 3 o'clock, but he told me that he didn't have to go back. Did you find out what went wrong there? No. You didn't talk to Epstein at all after that? No, I did speak to Mr. Epstein, and he doesn't know. All right. Right. Now, so here's a guy who has lunch with Epstein. That's Bill O'Reilly, by the way, coming out of Dallas, out of a Fox affiliate. I think it's a Fox affiliate out of Dallas. He moved from Long Island to uh, Dallas, Texas, and he, and he starts getting into this that year. Um <laughs> He has lunch with Epstein. What's that? Sorry, I'm 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 cheating and, and looking ahead while you're doing that. Remember, I'm doing. Oh right, yeah, we do have there. I thought we had the Orlando thing. Okay. Um, anyway, so O'Reilly shows up and and he is supposed to have an interview with Demar Chill that day as well. I just wanted to clear that up. Um, I don't know what the what we have the Geraldo footage. Let's take a look at, at it's that. About five minutes. I don't know how much we want to see or. Oh, well, let me just... Um, well, we'll start playing. You just tell me, skip, and do whatever. Right. You know the footage. I don't. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. He is Bouvier Beale, the forgotten first cousin of Jackie Onassis. Krista now has another story that begins with this eccentric lady, Ms. Beale, but it ends up in Dallas's Dealey Plaza. Krista? Geraldo, it is one of the strangest ironies of the Kennedy <laughs> assassination. This little-known story involves a mysterious Russian count named George de Morinschild, his ties with a Russian-speaking American named Lee Harvey Oswald, and Edith Bouvier Beale, who has finally decided to share her family's hidden secret. We all knew him. We all knew George. Indeed they did, as too did a little girl named Jacqueline Bouvier. As a little girl, an eight-year-old girl, she had played with, with Uncle George de Morinshield, and then he turns out to be her her husband's assassin's best friend. It is <laughs> okay, yeah, we don't need this now. Listen, we the... that's, that's enough. You, this is from earlier on. We could have used this. But, but, All right, we'll put this up on Locals. Folks. Yeah, we'll put it up on Locals, the whole thing from mm -hmm. Geraldo. But the, the, the situation now is that they're starting to close in on de Morinshield. And he gets a, the subpoena or the note from Gaten Fonzi, the investigator, when he goes back to his house in Palm Beach, or which is his daughter's place, from the lunch uh, with Edward J. Epstein. Uh, and he's in good spirits, blah, blah, blah. However, he, um, just to backtrack a little bit, his wife, um, Jean Lagan, had said that he had tried multiple attempts to uh, Epstein himself at home in, 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 in Dallas before this, and he had started to suffer from uh, depression. And he was visited by a man, a doctor, and, and this is from her, this is from her, a doctor who injected him with a substance that he didn't explain what it was, and he begins to descend into madness at that point in their home in Dallas, Texas. The doctor, I believe, was Jolly West. And I think Jolly West was sent there to do what he does to people that they want Jolly West to do something. Because from that injection, he is then sent to a mental institution by his wife. Uh, she signs the papers and he goes to a mental institution for 90 days. He gets out of the mental institution in Texas, and he is brought to Parkland Hospital, where Oswald and JFK both died, and he's given electroshock therapy in Parkland Hospital, according to his wife, uh, Jean Lagan. I got to jump in because um, there's Go timing with the super chat, and I worry about money. Uh, Parkland Park surgeon here, who's also read Oliver Stone's scripts. And notes, Brenda, the uh, script reviewer. Thanks for all you do, guys. 
Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, so perfect he, we have a park. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. He goes to Parkland. They give him uh, intravenous drugs and which I don't know what they were, but electroshock therapy. And he comes out like a lot of people do uh, worse than he went in because the people who meet him afterwards, including Epstein, say that he's a shell of his former self and he's completely damaged. He's frail. He like I said, he ends up in Palm Beach. And then he goes back to the house where this incident occurs. And I don't know how you want to handle this incident. All right, well, it, we're going to um, let me preface this and say. YouTube has certain rules and obligations and standards, and you never know exactly where things are going to go. Out. So I'm going to play some footage and I've kind of mucked it up and everything to try to make it more pleasant. I will put the unedited version up on Locals. And if you watch this and you go, where did that footage go? Well, it could be that the overlords have come down and we've had to remove this footage. What? So if all of a sudden we're talking and then we're just starting to talk about something else and nothing is here, please note that there may be a good reason and you need to go to Rumble or you need to go to locals and we'll make sure that everything is available in those locations and we're doing what I can or we can. And by the way, these super chats make a big difference because odds are extremely heavy. This thing is going to be yellow and probably well, won't be recovered. Sorry. Okay. Before you do that, can I just tell a little story before you get to that? Sure. Okay. When he was working with Oswald, he gets him a job at a place, um, that I, I'm just going to say this is a place called a Jagger child Stovall and they made maps for the military and the maps for the military they were working on at the time were U2 spy plane maps of the Island of Cuba during the Cuban missile crisis. And Oswald, obviously a defector comes back, he gets them this job. And one of the specialties that this uh, group did this photographic agency was microdots, And I don't mean acid, I mean, micro dot spy technology. Yeah, everything. Jack Barsky had one. I, I've had him on my show. Right, KGB guy. They they take a, a a picture and then a picture and a picture, so you get literally a dot, and then they can blow it back up to a document. Right. So this is what the technology was in 1963 when this is what they were developing at at Jagger Childs, and Oswald was involved with that, and Oswald was involved in uh, the the printing of these. This is a Pentagon related contract. This is a military contractual obligation when the Cuban Missile Crisis was occurring in 1962 that they were making these maps at, at Jagger Childs and also Microdot Technology and Oswald was working there at the time. That job was gotten for him by uh, George DeMornschild. I just wanted to put that in there before we, <laughs> before we do what we got to do to George DeMornschild. Right. And again, uh, there'll be footage. It shows it with clarity. I also have photographs that I will put up on locals, but, but we'll have a warning because, um, good looking guy. The most puzzling death yeah. of all was the apparent suicide of an Oswald associate, George de Morinshield. Now what brought the Morinshield to the attention of, uh, the committee was that, uh, when, Oswald returned from Russia. Oswald uh, supposedly was this uh, lower class guy who uh, was a working stiff, as it were. The Mornshield was a social figure. He was very much involved in Dallas society. And yet the Mornshield's relationship with Oswald seemed to be very close. His ex-son-in-law said if anyone could have been involved in, uh, with Oswald in the assassination of President Kennedy, it was the Mornshield. And so it was intriguing. We were interested when the House Committee was formed in questioning the Morin Shield. I received a call from a friend in Dallas, of all places, a journalist who told me he had just gotten uh, the news that the Morin Shield had committed suicide, put a shotgun to his head and pulled the trigger. Uh, but when the Morin Shield committed suicide and the newspapers picked it up and it got a major play, uh, Congress then decided politically they had to keep the committee alive. And so as a result of the Morin Shields death, uh, the committee continued. Uh, that's Gaten, that's Gaten Fonzie, by the way, the chief investigator for the House Assassinations Committee, um, uh, who was talking there. Awesome. Right. 
anyway, so, so you can see that I did the blurring and the effects to kind of tone things down. Right. Now, this, this is a controversial situation here because um, uh, people, some people believe he did it. Other people believe there was nefarious. Uh, the door was open. There, there's stuff to this, which would take a whole other episode just of this incident. Um, so... Well, didn't he reach out to somebody not long before this happened and maybe ex had a, a an exchange of letters? I, I don't remember. Oh, that's right. He, see, while he was being cornered by these nefarious people, he began to reach out to whoever could help him. He didn't go quietly in the night. He really didn't. I mean, this guy's being hunted, and he knows he's being hunted. He knows this game. He knows there's a ticking clock on him because he sees the other guys getting off left and right. So he reaches out to an old friend and he writes a letter to him and there's a letter back from the old friend. I thought maybe me and Hunley could read the two letters. I don't the... have the letter to the old friend. I, do. That's... I have that. Oh, you have it with you. Good. Yeah, okay. I have the letter too. Oh, okay. You just read the letter back. Okay. That sounds I'm good. I'm going to read the letter too. And you are the recipient of the letter. All right. But there's also a memo. Did I send you the memo about how he, the guy got the letter? I did not get a, a you memo. You didn't get the memo? Didn't get the memo. Well, I we, often don't get the memo. You didn't get the memo, huh? I don't get the memo. Often. Okay, not. Well, 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 I'll read the memo afterwards. But uh, let me just read the letter. Um, let's see here. It's dated um, September 5th, 1976. It's a handwritten letter. And it says, Dear George... This is from George de Uh Dear George, you will excuse this handwritten letter. Maybe you will be able to bring a solution to the hopeless situation I find myself in. My wife and I find ourselves surrounded by some vigilantes. Our phone is bugged and we are being followed everywhere. Either FBI is involved or this or they in this or they do not want to accept my complaints. We are driven to insanity by this situation. I have been behaving like a damn fool ever since my daughter, Nadia, died from cystic fibrosis, which is true, uh, over three years ago. I tried to write stupidly and unsuccessfully about Lee Harvey Oswald and must have angered a lot of people I do not know. But to punish an elderly man like myself and my highly nervous and sick wife is really too much. Could you do something to remove the net around us? This will be my last request for help, and I will not annoy you anymore. Good luck in your important job. Thank you so much, George DeMoran Schultz. Uh, dear George, please forgive the delay in my reply to your September 5th letter. It took time to explore thoroughly the manners you raised the matters you raised. Let me say first that I know it must have been difficult for you to seek my help in the situation outlined in your letter. I believe I can appreciate your state of mind in view of your daughter's tragic death a few years ago and the current poor state of your wife's health. I was extremely sorry to hear of those circumstances. In your situation, I can well imagine how the attentions you described in your letter affect both you and your wife. However, my staff has been unable to find any indication of interest in your activities on the part of federal authorities in recent years. The flurry of interest that attended your testimony before the Warren Commission has long since subsided. I can only speculate you may have become newsworthy again in view of the renewed interest in the Kennedy assassination and thus may be attracting the attention of people in the media. I hope this letter has been of some comfort to you, George. Although I realize I am unable to answer your question completely, thank you for your good wishes on my new job. As you can imagine, I'm finding it interesting and challenging. Yours, a very true, you're very truly yours, George Bush, director. All right, so that's his response from his old friend, um, George Bush, who, who who's a roommate at uh, Exit Academy, was the partner to George DeMornshield in an oil company, and was also George DeMornshield worked in uh, uh, Zapata Oil Company, the family Bush Oil Company. This is the response from, from Bush. Now, Bush gets this information from his staff at the CIA, and he writes this memo internally. Um, this is an inter... By the way, that was September 1976 that Eric just read. Um, yeah. The one... My, September, September 28th. September 1976. The letter was written September 5th. But there's a memo, an internal memo on the letter 
uh, in September 1976, internally at the CIA from Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, of course, the director of the CIA, which Eric just read. And this is an internal memo. And he says, I do know this man, Lauren Schultz. I first met him in the early 40s. Uh, he was an uncle to my Andover roommate. Later, he serviced in Dallas, 50s maybe. He got involved in some controversial dealings in Haiti. Then he surfaced when, Os uh, when Oswald shot to prominence. He knew Oswald before the assassination of President Kennedy. I don't recall his role in all this. At one time, he had or spent plenty of money. I have not heard from him many years until the attached letter came in which is the one that Eric just read. So clearly, uh, this is a man connected to many people in high places. If you get a letter back from the head of the CIA, uh, apparently you're well connected. And I mean a quick letter. I mean, that's, that's the same month he gets that reply. Again, uh, to no avail, because George Herbert Walker Bush apparently does not or cannot help him, Eric. Is that what you took away from that? or? Yeah, which then leads into... If he was cornered that much, he could have self-deleted or other deleted. I mean, either right. one could well, happen, depending on you know how desperate or what happened. I, I don't know. Well, I think they were worried about him spilling the beans. I mean, I, I think he knew that that his day had come. They were he was of no value to them anymore. He's saying, "I'm an old man," but the, apparently, he never shut up. I mean, he's writing memoirs, he's doing books, he's got a book on Oswald, he said, he refers to it in the letter saying, you know, maybe I, I spoke too much about Oswald, I wrote a book. Yeah, yeah, that'll get you killed. You think? That'll, yeah, that'll get you killed. <laughs> but at the beginning of the story, he was just a simple man from Europe <laughs> when we started the story, but who helped or may have known a lone nut who didn't know anybody, and the story continues to grow as we expand our coverage to more and more characters involved in the assassination of JFK. This was a simple story of a lone nut who was killed by an embittered nightclub owner. What seems to be the problem here, people? Why are so many people involved in this story? I mean, it just never seems to end. The DeMorne Schild angle that we just covered is only one of many pieces. We're going to get into Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw, by the way, is the American version in style and substance to the European George de Morinchild. He's a businessman. He becomes an asset. He comes back from Europe. He's debriefed on his trips. Clay Shaw is very similar as the American version of de Morinchild. Um, and, you know, de Morinchild was probably bisexual is what they're implying, because all of these guys had to operate behind enemy lines, so to speak, sexually and socially. And that's why they were mostly bisexual. And I think so is Oswald from what I've read. And the women. Uh, and the women, too. Absolutely. Everybody. Everybody in the intelligence services. Yeah. Uh, and, um, that's part of the I gig. Guess there are uh, major gay accusations between um, JDM and Altman. I haven't heard that. I wouldn't be surprised. I have not heard that. Um, but again, I think this goes with the job. You, uh, the, the, you know, I think there was a, uh, a situation where Oswald was with a, uh, a Russian army lieutenant or something. It was filmed in, in Moscow. There was something like that. And there was also two, two uh, Washington, D.C. columnists who were filmed with Soviet spies in, in the 1950s, guys who worked for the Washington Post. Uh, very common blackmail back in the days. Well, from what I've read, they were trained essentially to prostitute. In the yeah. Soviet Union, it's like, this is what you do. Right. Yeah, go, right. go do that. Well, we did it too. I mean, uh, you know, both sides obviously had to do it. I mean, Ruth Payne obviously had an affair or whatever you want to call it, a relationship involving uh, Marine Oswald, which the, if you read the love letters, it becomes, you know, pretty apparent. I mean, on, the lo on locals, <laughs> the, lo the love letters, which are on locals. And, and look, this episode is going to lead into more characters because we're going to do David Ferry at one point. We're going to do, um, you know, like I said, Clay Shaw, we're going to get to all of them and have a documented record in one location on the planet Earth. Uh, of each person and as much stuff and as much dots as I can find on every single one of these cats. Um, I, I had Eric put the books down below that yes, we they're used in the to... description. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So the, what I'm going to do is because I have over 350 books on the assassination. So for each character, I'm going to list the books so people can look for themselves of 
where I'm getting the information for each character if that makes any sense at home. And then like he's listed the books here that have DeMore and Schultz in them. Um, Our Man in Haiti by Joan Mellon is probably the most recent one, it has a lot of DeMore and Schultz information in there. Uh, Russ Baker's book. Um, this stuff is out there. It's not that I'm making this up. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of material out there and people are asking me this and that. And, you know, I'm just Hopefully it'll head off the comments because it'll head off the comments and stop <laughs> bothering me with, you know, where you're getting this shit from. I don't have time to go through and help you find everything that I'm talking about, you know, in the show. I just don't have time for that. But if we put the books up, you can buy the books, look in the index and look for it yourself and leave and it give Erica kickback. And give Eric, it. So, he's got some grif going on. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Every, every time know. you go to Amazon and buy one of the books, I get a little fraction of the price. Right. No cost to you. but Really? It. It's a I great a grift. Touch. It helps Eric put his kids and dogs and cats through college. And yep. uh, Now, it's not as good as Georgina, though. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is Georgina. for the lone nutter comment. I, yeah. The, yeah. It's so funny because I was telling Eric the other day, the zeitgeist has shifted completely. The lone nutter now, when I meet them or hear them or any of us meet them, they're the nuts now. They're the ones with the tinfoil hats. We wore the tinfoil hats early on in this 50-year uh, debate. Now they are the nuts. When I meet one of these guys, I, I, it, my parents raised me to, they said, never engage with a Holocaust denier. When you mm -hmm. engage with a Holocaust denier, they're, they win by your simple engagement with them. In other words, the victory in the debate is you engaging the debate with a Holocaust denier. We were raised that as Jews in New York. And I've, ne I've never, you know, engaged in a debate with a Holocaust denier because that's a victory for them that you're even talking about it. It's become the same thing with lone nut assassin theorists. You're debating them and having to explain 50 years of research to them and it becomes whataboutism. You know what I mean? My job is not to convince the lone nut that this was a conspiracy. We have moved so far past that as a culture, as a group of researchers, that we don't have the time or the effort or the willingness to con convince a deep state operative or someone who doesn't bother to read these books or only reads Ger uh, uh, Gerald Posner's Case Closed or Vincent Bugliosi's book. We don't have the time nor, nor the desire to debate with you about something we're now light years ahead of you. If that makes any sense to anybody who doesn't believe what we're involved in. We're way past this jigsaw puzzle looking for the final pieces. We don't have time to redo the entire jigsaw puzzle because you believe that a guy was in the sixth floor with a $5 rifle <laughs> knocking out three shots in six seconds with a magic bullet that went through 75 people. <laughs> And wounded everyone. We don't simply have the time. The zeitgeist, like I said, is reversed. You're the nut now. You're the nut. How does it feel, bro? You're the crackpot. How does it feel? Speaking of feeling awkward, like the Rolling Stone. Speaking of feeling awkward here, um, Pasha Moyer uh, had a story published in Reader's Digest. Does that mean? Uh -oh. uh, no, it doesn't mean. But I, I would suspect you highly. That's for sure. <laughs> Somebody in your family. I would look. I would look into your background. Definitely. There's some connection. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. And anyway. she kind of portrayed him as a man for sale. Right. That's true. That is true. Someone who can be trusted. True. Intelligence agencies never knew where he, he resigned. Right. He's the ultimate perfect intelligence operative. He is the, the cutout of, of what an intelligence operative should be. Doesn't have a political allegiance. Doesn't have a re care. Right. No yeah. loyalty. He's an internationalist. He is a good looking guy. He comes from money. He's able to nefariously work his way into the art world, all these different worlds. Uh, you'll see that later in Robert Fitzpatrick, who we're going to get into, who became the handler of Marina Oswald briefly, and then becomes the head of Johns Hopkins, and then the Chicago Institute of Art. Uh, there's a bunch of these Morinshill type people who operate in the shadows, but in the bright light. Also, uh, he ended up, Fitzpatrick, who we'll do an episode on, uh, running Euro Disney, for instance. A crazy story. Crazy, crazy story. All right. Thank you, JG. And um, well, who is I, this now? You need a freaking mind, mind map. map. Like, yeah, we need well, that. No, it's, yeah, yeah. And Any I need volunteers? more books. Let me tell you something. These books cost a fortune. I'm sitting here alone. Hungley's got a whole life. I need <laughs> PayPal money to buy these freaking books, Borelli. Thanks for the $9.99. Thank you. These books Very are good. expensive. And one more uh, from JG. 
I'll tell you, as a surgeon, an operator with three of the surgeons that were there. Oh, wow. There was more the trauma wound. There was more than one shooting. Yeah. I mean, the shot, I mean, you know, Crenshaw talks about the shot through the through the throat. I mean, that's that that first shot through the throat, which uh, Perry obviously does a tracheotomy on, uh, is a small caliber 22 or, or 32 that comes through the through the windshield, hits him in the throat, doesn't exit the back of the neck. That bullet must have been in the throat somewhere. It's always been my supposition. The entrance wound that becomes the uh, tracheotomy uh, is a straight on frontal shot into the throat. And they all see this. They all know this is the first shot. You see it in the film. Uh, later, the headshot comes from the front. But uh, you guys are doing the real work of freedom. Yeah, they'll get to us. Don't. We'll end up in a barrel in Biscayne Bay. But at least there'll be a record of this. No, 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 no. A barrel in, um, oh, God, what's that reservoir near you? Um, Where? Near me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nevada, California, the, the giant reservoir, Arizona, Nevada. There's a huge drought right now, and they're literally barrels with bodies in them are turning. No, out. no, that's great. You know, by Hoover Dam. Right, I forget okay. the reservoir over there, but anyway, it's running so low that they've got mafia victims from the 80s popping up with the barrels wow, because the wow. water is over 100 feet down. Wow, I like Lake that. Mead, Lake Mead. Lake Mead. Wow, that's Thank great. Thank you, folks. Eric. My brain wow. is fried. It's wow. been a long day. Well, it's, now, a, it's a good Friday for dots, though. You got to appreciate PayPal. And I hope you like the material, PayPal. The situation <laughs> with Eric with the with the merch, though. Eric, tell us, tell us. Oh, remember to subscribe. Yeah. Could it kill you? Could it really kill you? Are you going to get the Johnny Roselli treatment for subscribing? I think not. And it's free. So Make, look, if you've got a grandmother who's living in the back room in a wheelchair in your house or in the garage converted into an apartment, wheel her out. Get her to subscribe. It's it's the last thing she's going to do. Let it be worth something. Get your kids to subscribe. They have names too, right? You don't need a social security number to subscribe, do you, Eric? No, no. Okay, so anybody. Don't even need, well, as long as they have an account, they can subscribe. An and, account with YouTube. Yeah, yeah. They, they do have to have a login. Um. Also, we're on Locals and Structure.Locals.com. But before we go any further, obviously, we love everything PayPal, etc. But if you guys have watched the intro, then every episode, and the outro on every episode, the guy made that, and his name is James Esparza. All right. and he's also known as Tape Damage on Locals. And James, this guy, came out of nowhere, and he made this for us. We never asked him. He he volunteered. He put it out there just because he loved what we were doing and was so kind to make it. And now I've you know hired him somewhat and, and a pay him where I can to, to do editing for us. Well, as of today, his mother is in the hospital. She's fighting cancer. And James is not rich. His mother is not rich. They're both living essentially on the government dollar. And I have links inside of the description. And if you guys don't mind, um, I put, he had a, he had a GoFundMe set up and I asked him, I said, that's fine. You know, I put that there and donated to it. But I also, I said, please make a Gibson Go account because GoFundMe has screwed over so many people. So many people. A lot of people are saying, you know, screw these guys. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So there is also a Gibson Go. Good. Both okay. links are in the description below. And if you, if you don't mind, consider, you know, anything, $5, you know, whatever. It, it all really does help. Right. He doesn't. He doesn't have a lot of money, and right. she doesn't either. He, he's actually quite embarrassed to ask because he's doing it behind her back. You know, family pride, things like that. Right. So just you know, that'll help. At least consider that'll help. It. Now, so, in regards to what you, that's nice. Thank you, Eric. Sure. In regards to um, what you Merch. have. Now, yeah. I, oh, I was going to ask you about that. There's yes, a I of, ordered a puppy. Let me see. Could you show me what this puppy looks like, for Christ's sake? I have to get one of these puppies. Or I, I have not gotten it yet. I just, I literally just ordered it. Um, I think yesterday, but I, I did pay for rapid shipping. And by the way, on the merch, you reminded me, and I completely forgot. What? I believe it's twenty percent off right now. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty percent off of month our of merch. June or something, or is there a um, limited time? They, they did it. It's like for a week in June, and I think one day, and I don't know which day it is. So I can't. Don't quote me on it. Too. When it's I actually going to be this, like twenty five percent crap as soon as I get off of here. Oh, I know. There's stuff you want. <laughs> when, when does it run out? When does it run out? Uh, it's only going to be like a week long. It's a oh. short period, and then one day it's like twenty five percent, or it's you know more for that last day. Right. I want to get uh, that buck. I want to get those Grateful Dead tie dyed. 
in uh, the description. It's in the description. You can yeah, you can find below. that. I think you'll see all the all the items down there, Eric. Can you see all the merch? Well, you okay? You can see a few items, and then if you click on that, right. you can dig around in there, and then you can say, you know, look at all types, and and then that'll show you. Oh, look at all types. So I could get the tie dye Grateful Dead shirt. Yes, I think I made that. I made that available. The hat is sold out. The hat sold out already. Yeah, and the teddy bear sold out. What? What about uh, that bucket hat? I want to get that bucket. That's hat. the one. Yeah. That sold out? Yeah, it was when I looked on it um, yesterday. Uh, I got to uh, get that Grateful Dead shirt. This well, but it'll come back in. It'll come oh, back they in. will. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like sold out, period. If right. these are, if I had uh, the PayPal or... money, I could probably get the merch. That's the key. Oh, well, you know, there is that. There is that. Um, actually, now, what? Um, a, how do you join locals? Because I'm really curious about this. And how much is locals? Because there's a lot of, uh, I put up all this top secret information thank you, Ray. on locals. Hey, welcome. I put um, up a lot of top secret. I don't want people to get it unless they're on locals. So I put it up behind the paywall to the members. Right, right, right. Unstructured.locals.com. You can go there. Right. You can follow us for free. Now, things that Mark put behind the paywall, you won't see that. But there's a lot that you is can shared see. that you can see for free. Also, there's another advantage. If um, I get taken down, we get taken down by YouTube, etc. I can email like 5,000 plus people. I can email everybody and say, hey, uh, this is where we are. This is what's right. going on. So Dr. it, it Dr. allows Bloom, us to- Dr. Bloom and Doom here. He's got a he's got a, a bunker mentality. You have backup plans and backup plans. You got well, the thing that. is I've I'm never, there. and I've never used that email for any reason. And it's right. it's just there quite literally for that. If we now get how take much it down- is it? It's like 50, 60 bucks a year, 70 bucks if, a year? If you, choose to, if you choose to be a supporter. Right. So it's free to join and free to right. follow. Right. But if you want to support us, which I highly encourage, obviously, right. it's five dollars a month or fifty dollars a year. Fifty bucks for the whole year? Yeah, and yeah. that's pretty cheap, Hunley. I, maybe we should raise that. Well, fifty <laughs> for the whole year? What are you kidding me? Even Barnes are seven dollars a month, and Scott Adams is at seven dollars a month. Oh, I'm oh, not. Right. I, I'm right. not going there yet because I don't Wait, feel like. My, do you get my book for free? Rehab Nation Inside the Secret World of Celebrity Rehabs. You get you that do. too. You do. Uh, by the way, those because I get emails or support calls saying, "Where do I find it?" What if oh, you if you're a paid member, just search Rehab Nation, right? And and it'll pop up. There's a post with the book in it, right? And it, it is there. Um, unfortunately, it's not great on organization for some of us, so it's difficult for me to just say, "Here's a playlist of fill in the blank." Right. But they are there. You can and, follow me on Twitter at Lord Buckley if you if you want to say anything, direct message me or whatever crazy crap you got on your mind over there. And also the comment section. Hunley and I respond to these uh, insane comments for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want Mark to comment, especially. Mark, Mark will get... I, uh, I like responding Mark, to the Mark comments. Mark gets, gets pugilistic. He's no, like, no, oh, but come I mean, on, come on, man. Nut, I don't want to answer a nut. But I mean, if you got a legitimate <laughs> question, I mean, I'll definitely do as best I can to answer it. That's for sure. I'm not there to do battle. I don't, I'm not on time for that. You know, I, I don't want to get into a fight with people. I mean, if you got a legitimate comment or question, I'll be happy to answer it about any of this stuff. If I know, if I have a link or whatever, I'll be happy to share it. But so you could comment down below or when you go to locals, it's obviously like a full scale commentary there. Right, Eric? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wide open. And if you're a member, then you can post too. And I highly encourage Oh, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. It's like your own Twitter. Uh, or Facebook. It's even it's better. It's like Facebook. Facebook because you can write long posts. You can, right. you know, you can post uh, videos. But it's not movies. censored is the key thing here. This right. is you, Right. That's the key on locals. You can write whatever the F you want. And, and we can't even show the picture here of DeMorne Schultz. True. His uh, his self elimination, as Eric, as Eric mentioned, we can't even show. Well, that I'm having to train Mark on, you know. Self I don't even know the lingo. I mean, he's. I, and me we're already going to be. In, we're probably in trouble anyway. But right. <laughs> does it say uh, yellow or something? Are we on red it, alert? Oh, shush! Sure. I, I forgot yeah. to I forgot to turn on monetization, and then I turned it on. So it hasn't hasn't oh. caught yet. Maybe, maybe right. I'll get lucky. I don't know. Well. <laughs> I hope that I hope those videos stay up because I hate when they we have to cut them out. You know what I mean with those uh, copyright things. But we'll do yeah. the best we can. But on locals, you you see it all, right, Eric? That's the point. You could see the yeah. Un uh, yeah well, we're, we deliberately put things up there that are without not commercial in the interruption. Show. There's no commercials or yeah, as uh, as I can, I upload that. But then there's also pieces like I'll put the Geraldo up there, but I'll probably oh, upscale great. it first so it looks better. Right. Um. Th things like that. So we don't just I don't just 
the videos that Mark gives me a lot of times are 360p and I have software and I literally enhance it to make oh, yeah. it bigger it to job. give the screen. And yeah, know, a lot of these videos are from the seventies and sixties and stuff. And, and Eric does something to them or something. I don't know how he does it, but it involves a secret sauce, his cat, his wife gets involved <laughs> and then they go out in front. I, I'm not really sure. I don't really want to know, but the fact is he makes them look much better. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. And yeah. Until Tuesday, folks. Um, what what happens actually, on Tuesday? Well, we'll do something. Oh, oh okay. So <laughs> uh, now, if you're on locals, I'll have a stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. That one is for paid supporters. It's oh, not. Uh, oh, it's a not tough a tough guy. What? Huh? Uh, I'm not a tough guy. It, 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 it's <laughs> PayPal, one little stream. Me. PayPal me so I can get the books and keep Hunley alive. Do the right <laughs> thing. I know a lot of you are sitting at home saying this guy might be bullshitting me, but he seems entertaining. Maybe I should PayPal him. Go ahead, do it. That's the winning choice. And until Tuesday, see you later. Mm -hmm.